All right, yesterday we finished at the end of just looking at reinforced concrete by just having a conversation about what reinforcing was. And what I wanted to try and get done in that time was to also look at pre-stressed and post-stressed reinforced concrete. So we're gonna do that now. It should only take about 10 minutes to finish off. But just so that we're back on the same page, so to remind you of where we were at last time, reinforcement in, when you're using concrete is generally done with something like steel. Um, there's a purpose to it and that's to hold the, the uh, concrete into, um, when it's under tension. So when it's being pulled apart, it's going to hold the concrete a little bit longer and make sure those cracks that we talked about don't start to get too strong or develop to a point where it fails. So the reinforcement is there to hold the concrete. Now there's something about that we'll come back to in a moment. And what is concrete again? Concrete is that combination. Yeah, so there's a, there's a combination, it's a composite material, and the things to remember are that it's cement, and then sand, which is a binding agent with the cement. Then you've got aggregate, which is generally just any rock or material to bulk it out, to give it some, some strength as well in the way in which that goes together. And the final ingredient, which is what helps to make it plasticize and be able to use, uh, and the thing that makes it become gel-like when these two things com combine and then finally harden, is your water content. And we mentioned that generally that can be made up. You can make it on site. A lot of people used to do that, little cement mixer on site, put the ingredients together in the ratios you want. If you didn't want to have aggregate in it, you could get away with just the sand and cement. You can use the sand, uh, mixtures of sand and cement for mortar and all different ratios. Um, type of sand you use, there's fatty sands and there's not so fatty sands. And what that means is it just changes the way in which the cement and sand react together. It's a whole bunch of stuff here. Um, fortunately, you guys don't have to know all of that. If you go into careers as concrete, as you might, um, you know what Italian's in here, is it? So that's usually where you finish up. But no, water and aggregate are going to also be part of the process. Now, the other thing I mentioned was that moving, keeping it mobile is part of the process too. So that as soon as it sets or stops, it starts to set. And so you can make this stuff up miles away. As long as the concrete is being moved all the time, so the vans or the, the big concrete trucks can come from wherever they're being put together and take it to a site to be manufactured. Um, the little videos that we've got, you, some of you watched already, indicate how the, you, know, you take it into a hopper, you bring the hopper up, you start pouring it. You've got a time frame over to which you work that. Again, the combinations will alter that. So that's concrete. When you put all those things together, you get the concrete. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Now, the reinforcement, as we put it in, was just done, as I mentioned in the, uh, the, the previous one and in the little videos, it's already in a formwork. So you've got this timber, usually timber, could be plastic, it could be something that just needs to be pulled apart at the end. So you've got a formwork in which you've got a container-like structure where the concrete's going to form, and into that you place some reinforcement. This is the metal mesh. Um, if it's going to be a beam or support loads that bend downwards, you usually put it at the bottom. If it's going to bend that way because it's a raft slab or something like that, you're going to put it closer to the top because that's the part where it's going to be in tension and that's what you're trying to help pull together. And then you pour your concrete into it. Usually have to give it a bit of an agitation. That agitation helps to get rid of air bubbles because air bubbles become a, a problem. And sometimes you can hit the side of the container or even have a pounding device that goes around and bangs it. Another thing that happens when you do that is a lot of the aggregate settles towards the bottom. Uh, the sand will also go down. And so a smoother sandy mix comes to the top. And that sandy mix can then be what they use those things called a helicopter, which you've seen those big flat blades that run around, smoothing out the top surface. And if you're really, really good at this, you can get it so that you can finish it to a point where people sometimes just polish and lacquer it. Um, there are some, a lot of uh, civic structures where they just go leave the concrete as is. We're not going to do anything with it because it looks fine. In other places too, they say, well, don't even worry about it. What, and you might see sometimes when you're going into car parks where they've used big columns of concrete that have been in forms. And when they take it off, there's holes in it. That'll be the air bubbles. And again, because it's structurally sound, those little imperfections 
really aren't a problem. You might even see some of the aggregate rock coming through at certain places. Uh, probably because they haven't gone around and given it that sort of whacking process. Generally speaking though, what we're talking about with reinforced concrete is just letting it do its thing. Let the concrete do its own thing and settle around the material. With these two though, we're doing something additional. If the issue, and I'll just return to that little diagram I did in the other video, where if you are bending a beam, that's being loaded, and of course this, this bending I'm doing here is a massive exaggeration on what's really going on. They do not bend that far. As I said yesterday, if they bend that far and they were driving a truck over it or something, you'd be driving uphill to get off the bridge. And it's, so you're talking about only minor bending, but it's bending's enough. And it's certainly enough to open the cracks at the bottom. And what we looked at was that you get a massive compression section at the top and a tension section at the bottom. And it sort of, and a, a way of drawing that might be to look at the, the change between tension and compression across the beam through the neutral zone. This is actually something we'll get to learn about later where you're looking at compression at the edge at the top, tension at the bottom, and where that particular point is, there's a moment of inertia process going on here, is where you put the distance, it becomes a, like a moment's problem. How far away that is, is what gives you the forces going at a distance. We'll be working with that much later in the course, but for the moment, you can see that the further you go away from the neutral zone or from wherever that middle section is, the zero lining, the higher the tension. So your big tension elements are right towards the edges. So we place our reinforcement somewhere like that. But we also know that the material is good in compression. It actually doesn't mind being in compression. So what if we could somehow reduce the amount of tension down the bottom by increasing the compression in the whole thing. And I'll change the color of the pen just to show you. We don't actually change the loading situation. We add compression to the material to begin with and that particular set of forces then changes and the tension now is much less. Now how do you do that? by increasing the compression. What, what are you saying? Are we, are we gonna put more load on the sides to make it work? Well, maybe that will, if you do it the right way. So what the theory is, or it's not a theory, it's, a, it's a, an observable fact that this works. If we were to get that point where we put the reinforcement and we were to grab hold of it and somehow tighten that so that we're actually putting compressive force here so that the wire itself or the reinforcement itself is pulling the material together rather than allowing it just to laterally stretch then when we come to bending it like this the tension has moved up because we've actually put compression into it to begin with what that means is like this we put our wire in or our reinforcement, we put that under compression, so there's a compressive force happening here. So now when we start to load it, we have to move that compression force further up out of the object, and therefore the tension, which would have normally been much greater, has come closer to the surface. So until, you, basically what you're doing is you've got to overcome the compression to get to the tension. So if you're squashing the object to begin with, when you start loading it, you've got to overcome the squashing before you can start loading it in tension. Does that make perfect sense? Because that's the, that's the, when I said the theory, that's the idea behind it. Right? That's what works. And then we can see what, is, what we're talking about here is pre-stressing. We're putting a stress into the concrete before we use it, pre-use pre-stressed concrete. Now that sounds reasonably easy to do. All you have to do is somehow tension the wire. Now that's the opposite of what I just said, isn't it? I said tension the wire or tension the... If it's a cable, that's why I talk about wire, if it's reinforcement, if it's a steel beam, you tension it. Why? Well, 
Go back to the box we had up here where we've got our formwork and we're going to pour our concrete in. This time what we're going to do is we're going to, with our mesh, we're going to grab the mesh and pull it, possibly through a hole in the box, some hydraulic ram or a screw thread that winds and pulls the wire into tension. Right, so you're pulling the wire. So this is now stretching. Now what's the good thing about metals again? When you look at them and they create that diagram, you've got this elastic nature that we're going to rely on here. We're going to utilize the ability of it to want to come back. And the loading, the force that I'm putting into it, will be returned to me when it comes back. Right, so the force that I'm putting in and stretching it will be allowable, will, will be come back to me when it elastically returns. So now, think that through for a second. We're going to pull the wire, we pour in the concrete, we agitate the sides, we leave it alone and let it set. Then we come back and we release the tension. So it's in tension, we release the tension. What's the wire going to do? It's going to want to pull back. So it starts to sp spring back. And as it springs back, it applies the compressive force that we're looking for. Fair enough? So it's not a hard thing to do. That's why it's pre-stressing the reinforcement. You're pulling the reinforcement prior to letting it be loaded. Then you let it go hard and you bring it together. Now there's the downside to that process. And the downside is that you need these big forms. You need to have to have somewhere where you can either make these and construct them and big hydraulic rams to pull it and you've got to have loading. So you might have to, one end might be locked and the other end has a hydraulic ram on it that's pulling it out. And then when you release it, you've got to knock the forms down and you've got to take them somewhere. Now that's, that's okay. What we talk about then is called pre-cast reinforced concrete. It can be even one sentence, pre-cast, pre-stressed, reinforced concrete. as a full descriptor of it. So then the formwork's taken away and you could make up a beam. So let's say an I-type beam. There's a reason why I-beams are shaped like that, but we're not dealing with that today. Uh, it has to do with where you get those distances to give that depth while reducing a lot of mass by taking some of the material away, but still having the box-like rigidity, that shape could have your metal mesh running through it that can be pulled, and they would probably stick out the ends of it. You're starting to look familiar. Sometimes you might see these things being transported on the backs of trucks to sites. What we tend to do now is that we tend to have places that make these things to set sizes. And so when designers build bridges, they tend to work in set units. Now you can get them made the different lengths to order. It's more expensive to do that. But if you've got a formwork that's already one size and you're just doing this over and over again, you make these standard sizes, then you start to reduce the cost of building. And what you can finish up doing is making up a whole row of these guys that you can put together, that you can then put a road surface over. So you just build it up, keep going. The thing which you do with those probably then is you need to have them either. One of two methods generally get used, and that is where you just simply drop them into a support. Maybe the bridge is long enough to go between two supports, and that's all it is. Or you make a bigger support and you have two more before you get to the ends. Or you do the cantilever process, where you have a bit coming out from one support and a bit coming out from the other support, and you come along and you drop in a precast, pre-stressed, reinforced section, all being transported to site from another manufacturing site. Sometimes too, when they're building bridges, they might actually build that whole thing to the side. So they'll clear an area beside the bridge and they'll make up their forms on site and then get them craned up when they you know, make, make a few of them, let them go hard, take a few days to get it, let it go off, and then start putting them up. Yeah. Um, with the pre-stress reinforcement, do they, they, do they let the 
left goal is attention they have on the skill after the concrete set? Yes. Yes, the seeker, the, the, for those who didn't hear that, the question was, do they let it set first? Most definitely. Pointless otherwise. Because you're not introducing any stress if you don't do that. If you, if you just release it while it's still soft or it still hasn't gone set, obviously the, the, the cable's just going to move inside the material. The other thing that you have to make sure of then is that it doesn't just have cable. So often there's, on the wires or the cabling, there's lots of little hooks and you may see that on cabling. And those little hooks grab into the material or it's a mesh that has been stretched and the mesh pulls on the material as well. Otherwise, all you're doing is just creating a nice little hole inside the material, inside the concrete. Fair enough? Okay, last one then, just to finish this whole thing off. So that makes sense, doesn't it? You can make castings, bring them to site. So standard sizes as everything works, you can start to build bridges really quickly. When we go to this excursion I was talking about, one of those bridges down there has been built this way. And you, you probably have to start thinking, which one is it? Because it's really easy. You'll see it when you get down there, because we get underneath and you can see how that was constructed. Now, the other type is one of the ones that we did as a little exercise here when we did those three structures. You know, the arch, and then we did the truss, and we had one which was just made of blocks. And those blocks had a hole drilled through them and then we put tension into the blocks. We didn't quite manage to get enough tension to make it really strong, but it got the idea across. You can hold them together. That's this guy. Post-stressed, after you do everything. This is before it goes hard and before it's put in situ. This one is in situ after it's gone hard. So you do the casting, but this time, instead of putting the mesh direct, you might have mesh in it as part of the reinforcement process, but that's not going to introduce the, ten the compression that we're looking for. So what you do this time is you leave hollows, tubes running through, cast around those tubes. Then when you get to site, you put maybe two or three blocks together now they might not be that long, they might be smaller. Um, in fact, the bridge down here was made in sections that are little platform sections that look something like this, and we'll show you some drawings of all these. And in here it's largely hollow, and that's actually used for inspection. So the whole road surface sits on top of this, and they were in large groups like that, and they made several of these. Uh, I'm not sure how many, probably in the order of about 80, I think, were made in that bridge. And then, through that, you run a whole bunch of cables. You don't rely on one here. You put maybe four or five, and they may even be multi-strand cabling. Well, it will be multi-strand cabling, so you can get that flexibility into it. Then, at one end, you lock it off. You get your hydraulic ram. You sit it on there, and you pull the wire through until it starts to close everything up and you sort of, like we were doing with the wedges with those blocks, you're tightening and tightening and tightening until it jams everything together, locks it all off, introduces the level of compression that you're after because you're actually dialing in the compression. You've got the opportunity to set it to a certain type. So this time, instead of later relying on the elasticity of the material to produce the strength, you can even go further now. Because if you push the wire too far in the pre-stressing type, in this type, you might exceed the elastic limit and start to deform the, the, the wire, in which case you've lost all the advantage. So there's a limit to how much pressure you can apply, how much compressive force you can apply at the end. With this guy, if you apply too much, what are you going to do? You're going to crack the concrete because there's a limit to its compressive ability as well. But what you can do now is induce so much more t compression that you even move this even further away. And you can have situations, if you, if you, you won't get there of course, because there's, there's always gonna be a need for it to, to stretch, but you can get to a place where you can reduce the deformation because it now wants to stay compressed a lot longer. So there's a whole lot of things you can dial in when you do this. And the other one is, whereas before you needed to put supports underneath here, 
you can get it to a place where you can reduce the number of supports and therefore have larger spans. Can you see all those things happening? All right. And again, all it really is about is making the bottom end less tensioned. It will be tensioned, it'll have to be, by introducing compressive forces at points at the sides and squishing it. Yep. This one, is t it tends to be a little bit more expensive to do. And the reasoning is that this process has to take place on site. You can still bring in precast elements. So you can still make them elsewhere, ship them in, put it together. It tends to be more quicker, so then you reduce some of the speed. So you, because you can put it together on site, you don't have as many um, uh, support mechanisms for it. They, they, they balance it. All right? But it's harder to actually do in the first place because you've got to build a big form to put them under. Uh, when we look at the bridge down here, you'll see how they had to have a crane in to bring it all in. Whereas these other pieces before, the pre-stressed ones can be dropped into site, a little bit simpler. So yeah, which one's more expensive, which one's better? It's gonna depend on what it's using for. The point is we now have three different ways of dealing with it. And in that third of the videos I put together, they were talking about the advantages that came out in the 30s and 40s, and by the 50s, 1950s, in understanding how to do this, as opposed to just that. I think yesterday too, I mentioned something, and I, meant, I, I realized after I'd said it, I said that you know, the, when concrete, when cement was created, uh, uh, the Portland cement, I said that was the 1900s. I meant to say the 19th century, because it was 1820 something, not 1920 something. They were building concrete homes in the mid 1900s in England. And I did it again, mid 1800s. Yeah, 19th century, 1800s. That always gets me, that does. Anyway, so you know what I'm talking about because I think there's a date line somewhere on one of the videos too. Yeah, so get, just get a feel for when things happen too. That's really good to know. So by the 50s, pre-stressed and post-stressed concrete, big structures like the Hoover Dam and places like that, one of the biggest concrete structures ever made in America, the Hoover Dam is a huge one. It was uh, uh, one of those, um, not work for the dole ideas, but it was one of those ideas during the depression to give people work that they build this thing, it's the infrastructure stuff. Pretty much like the Snowy Mountain Scheme here when we were building our infrastructure, we brought all these people out from Europe to help us with the concreting processes there. That was mainly all done just in reinforced concrete. It was casting, putting in concrete, letting it just set. Bridges today, the Gladesville Bridge in Sydney, concrete reinforced pre-stressed concrete bridge, the bridges down here, post-stressed concrete reinforced bridge. So you get more and more of these now. So anything, probably anything from say mid 60s on in this country, maybe mid 50s in America, mid 60s here, would it be one of those types of structures. Big structures. Right? Your house slab is probably still just gonna be that. They're just gonna put the Rio in, pour the concrete, screed it all off, let it go off, and you're good to go. Um, driveways and other things are gonna be there. You're not gonna go to this much trouble. Yeah. Okay, so they're the things to know. They're all related, they're similar, but it's all about trying to stop this bottom section, the weakest element, becoming overstressed, overstretched, and those cracks breaking the material. Good? All right. As I said, that was just to finish that off from yesterday. Um, there'll be some notes about this stuff too I'll put on, on the web so you can read it as well. I'll put that together today sometime. Okay.